Hey guys, uh, hope you're doing okay today. We are we are super close to the end of the year. Um, this is not straight. Shoot, I don't have my book. Alrighty, hey guys. Now we're ready to finally get started. I'm going to you know start off with a recap of chapter two again, real quick for you. And chapter two, pretty straightforward, pretty simple plot wise. Actually, I mean the whole novel is pretty straightforward plot wise. Not much happens here, but it's all in the analysis and, and what the interactions between the characters look like and the symbolism. So that's what we'll really take a look at. So Nick and Tom are hanging out one day. They're on a train heading into the city and they make an unplanned stop. Um, the train is just kind of idling in this place called the Valley of Ashes and Tom is feeling really antsy and suddenly he gets up, drags Nick along with him and says, hey, you're going to go meet my mistress. I don't need to tell you how bizarre that is, right? The fact that Tom is about to take his wife's cousin uh, to go meet his mistress. It's weird. You would never do that, right? They meet Myrtle. Uh, that's Tom's mistress's name. And George Wilson as well. And he's going to be important later. George does not know that Myrtle's having an affair on him. He, he's so dumb he doesn't even know he's alive is what Tom says about him. So anyway, all three of them head into town and they decide to have a party with some of Myrtle's friends. Surprisingly, Tom has an apartment that he keeps to um, bring Myrtle to. And really they just, uh, they, they hang out there and have nice you know, clean, fun. On the way there, Myrtle buys a dog. That's important. We'll talk about that. And, and they invite some friends over. But uh, the contrast between the party that Myrtle has and the little tea dinner party we saw with Daisy is pretty stark, right? You get um, a complete tonal difference as far as like the decorum people carry themselves with, where Daisy, Jordan, and Tom were kind of very hoity-toity, uh, you know, noses lifted up type atmosphere. Myrtle's is comparatively, Myrtle's party is comparatively chaotic, right? Everyone's drinking, everyone's, some people are doing drugs, uh, and just getting absolutely wild. Myrtle, as the party goes on, she upsets Tom because she keeps saying Daisy's name. When she won't stop, Tom decides to just break her nose, slaps her across the face, she bleeds all over her nice couch, and Nick, deciding he's had enough, he leaves with one of the party guests named Mr. McKee. Next thing we know, Nick wakes up in the subway, and that's that. So, let's take a closer look at some of these uh, you know, plot points so we can get an understanding of who these characters are and what Fitzgerald's trying to communicate to us symbolically. Uh, firstly, let's start with the Valley of Ashes, right? This is a pretty elegant symbol for the decaying of the American dream. You know, you think about the first thing you see when you arrive as an immigrant through New York City, right? As you're coming to this land of promise to seek out things. You see the Statue of Liberty, this is one of the first things you see anyway, and her holding that flame, right? The torch. And the Valley of Ashes, uh, consider what happens when you blow a fire, or when you dis extinguish a fire. Uh, there are ashes left behind, right? Or when a fire burns something up, there are ashes left behind. So the Valley of Ashes is literally this valley filled with people whose dreams have fallen apart. They've failed in their endeavors. Um, you can see this most clearly in one of the characters we meet, George Wilson. Um, every time Fitzgerald describes George Wilson, whose dream was to own a successful car repair shop, um, we see everything covered in dust. Uh, oh, sure, agreed Wilson hurriedly and went toward the little office, mingling immediately with the cement color of the walls. A white ashen dust veiled his dark suit and his pale hair as it veiled everything in the vicinity, except his wife, who moved close to Tom. Uh, let me read one more excerpt about Myrtle, the mistress, real quick. 
I heard footsteps on a stairs, and in a moment, the thickish figure of a woman blocked out the light from the office door. She was in the middle 30s and faintly stout, but she carried her surplus flesh sensuously, as some women can. Her face, above a spotted dress of dark blue creme de chin, crepe de chin, contained no facet or gleam of beauty, but there was an immediately perceptible vitality about her, as if the nerves of her body were continually smoldering. So Myrtle is consistently described as being on fire. If you continue to pay attention to her throughout the novel, you'll see that the color associated with her predominantly is red. So when you think of her, you think of a fire burning, right? And why is Myrtle on fire while everyone else seems to be gray with ash? Well, if you consider again, the Valley of Ashes represents the decay uh, of the American dream. What we're seeing about Myrtle is her dream has not decayed and the reason why in that last excerpt is again she moves close to Tom. So Myrtle we can assume her dream is to be successful. I mean that's anyone's dream but to be rich right and she is well on her way to becoming a rich woman if she continues to move closer to Tom both physically and emotionally right but everyone else in the Valley of Ashes covered in that dust that represents the failure of their dreams right the things that the you know their dreams have been extinguished essentially looking out over the valley of ashes is this billboard of an oculist named dr tj eckelberg and i won't read the excerpt on tj eckelberg it's right at the start of the chapter but this is a pretty you, you kind of have to treat it like a math equation almost right we have a billboard uh, which is a symbol of material wealth and, and uh, capitalism, if you will, coupled with the giant eyes, which oftentimes represent Big Brother or God even, right? These giant eyes in the sky looking down on people. And so when you combine a symbol of God with a symbol of capitalism or wealth, what we essentially get is this inelegant equation, if you will, uh, saying that money is God to these people. And think about it. I mean, if you're poor, the thing you worship most, most likely is going to be money. That's going to be the, the, the catalyst to change in your life. Many people don't think, you know, it's going to be religion or relationships or anything like that. It's money. Money, right money is what's going to change my life is kind of what they'd imagine so yeah money is God to them they, they worship it I guess that's what Fitzgerald's trying to say about Americans as they're on their way into town or into the city to Myrtle and Tom's apartment um, Myrtle stops and buys a dog right or she wants to buy a dog and it's kind of a bizarre little scenario Tom's very dismissive in that moment he's like whatever I'll, I'll get I don't care um, but Myrtle seems really intent on getting this dog. And what this tells us about Myrtle, uh, again, her dream is to be with Tom, right? And you think about, think about any relationship, really. As you move forward, one of the most natural steps, you know, is uh, eventually, let's say you get married, right? Uh, next step after that is to get your own place, right? If you didn't get it before you got married. And then the next step after that is to make a house feel like a home, is to start creating a family. Now, you know, most couples aren't ready to start a family with a child, and so what do they do? They get a dog, right? Or most couples, to see their compatibility in raising something, will get a dog together. It's like a landmark step in most relationships. And for Myrtle, what she's trying to do is, Tom's taking her to this apartment where he just uses her uh, to, you know, do stuff whereas Myrtle you know she's doing it with uh, with a goal in mind she wants to be with Tom and so she thinks that if I can take that next step in our relationship and add a dog to the equation right that that you know I'm gonna kind of define the relationship a little bit more that's what she's thinking and it's tragic because you understand the way that Tom treats the dog the way that he talks to Myrtle and how the chapter ends he has no intention of ever progressing things with Myrtle I didn't think it I'd say it'd be unfortunate that you know his mistress is never going to get what she wants because it's an illegitimate relationship anyway but yeah I don't know you kind of feel bad for Myrtle by the end of the novel you'll see why one more thing about Myrtle's encounter or Myrtle's relationship with Tom is the way that they met. So as the party continues, Myrtle tells the story of how she and Tom met. I'm going to recount that to you guys. And as I read through it, I want you to pay attention to what Myrtle seems to be describing 
most. It was on the two little seats facing each other that are always the last ones left on the train. I was going up to New York to see my sister and spend the night. He had on a dress suit and patent leather shoes and I couldn't keep my eyes off him. But every time he looked at me, I had to pretend to be looking at the advertisement over his head. When we came to the station, he was next to me in his white shirt front pressed against my arm and so I told him I'd have to call a policeman, but he knew I lied. I was so excited that when I got into a taxi with him, I didn't hardly know I wasn't getting into a subway train. All I kept thinking about over and over was, you can't live forever. You can't live forever. So when they first meet, she doesn't describe his eye color or you know the way his hair was done or the look of his face. She says he had on these nice patent leather shoes, this dress shirt. She describes the material things about her encounter with Tom. Right. Moving forward, she's not even looking at him as they're first making their encounter. She's on the subway train, right? And she's looking at the billboard over his head. So very early on, their relationship is defined by materialism, right? She's not even looking at him when she starts to fall in love with him. She's looking at a billboard. Again, Myrtle is very obviously very deeply materialistic and we get so many hints at that, but that's just one of the major sections we see it. One more thing I want to draw your attention to as far as Nick goes, he is a great narrator, right? And uh, he's multifaceted in many different ways and he brings attention to that. Each time I tried to go, I became entangled in some wild strident argument which pulled me back as if with ropes into my chair. Yet high over the city, our line of yellow Hello, windows must, must have contributed, have contributed their, their share of human secrets. secrets. The casual watcher in the street. And I was him, too, looking up and wondering. I was within and without. Enchanted and repelled by the inexhaustible variety of life. Okay, this is going to take me a while to get through here, but Nick is saying he felt that he was both at the party, but he was also an observer from outside, like literally all the way outside the building. He's not. He's definitely there at the party, but what he's trying to tell to us is, man, I can see life in so many different ways, right? Like, I am both Daisy's cousin, but I'm also Tom's friend, and I'm here as Tom's friend right now, and this party is fun, but as Daisy's cousin, I can also see just how horrible this is and the decisions Tom's making, how corrupt and morally bankrupt they are. You know, he's essentially saying, I can, I can see multiple perspectives. I, I can be fair and unbiased. We know that he can't be necessarily completely unbiased, and any first-person narrator is going to carry a little bit of bias. You know, and, and, you know, he certainly does that in his description of Tom in Chapter 1, where he's just overly... Uh, critical and negative in his description of Tom so that before we even hear Tom speak we have this idea and the sense that Tom's a jerk but you know Nick is a great narrator as far as being a East Egg type bloodline you know person American living in West Egg right so he can see both the East Egg side of things and the West Egg side of things he's both Tom's friend Daisy's cousin and one last thing I'd draw your attention to and this is more of a theory uh, and I argue with people about it all the time but I believe that Nick is also bisexual right uh, now hang with me for a second and it's I, I think it's important for this reason right we're going to examine the title character Gatsby in both the way that a man who respects him would look at Gatsby and a man who is, uh, or just a person who is attracted to Gatsby, how they would feel about him. Two different perspectives uh, of Gatsby that help us build a fuller picture and that's what makes Nick an effective narrator. Now you're asking, where in the world is the evidence that Nick is bisexual? And if you notice the situation with the McKees, that's where I'm going to bring you guys. So when the McKees come, there's some of Myrtle's friends that attend the party. This is how they're described. It's really interesting. Mr. McKee was a pale, feminine man from the flat below. He had just shaved, for there was a white spot of lather on his cheekbone, and he was most respectful in his greeting to everyone in the room. He informed me that he was in the artistic game, and I gathered later that he was a photographer and had made the dim enlargement of Mrs. Wilson's mother, which hovered like an ectoplasm on the wall. His wife was shrill, 
languid, handsome, and horrible. She told me with pride that her husband had photographed her 127 times since they had been married. Now, if you went up to a girl and said, you're so handsome, um, most girls would probably be offended by that, right? Um, it's not a compliment. It's not an adjective you use in conjunction with women a lot. Handsome is almost like a gender-specific male compliment, right? Um, so for... Fitzgerald, who is a master of language, to very explicitly and very specifically call Mrs. McKee handsome uh, is not a mistake. He's saying that she's somewhat masculine in a sense, right? Whereas Mr. McKee is described as feminine, right? He just goes right out and says Mr. McKee's a feminine dude. He's into the artistic game. This comes to a head later when Nick leaves with Mr. McKee. Uh, this is going to get a little PG-13 right here, but I'm going to read one more scene to you. When Mr. McKee and Nick leave, they get on an elevator together, and in this time, an elevator boy had to pull a lever to pull to send you up and down, right? Like, you couldn't just push a button on the elevator. Someone had to control the elevator for you. It was a job that you could have. Um, and when they get on the elevator, this is what happens. Let me go ahead and read it to you. Mr. McKee turned and continued on out the door, taking my hat from the chandelier. I followed. Come to lunch someday, he suggested as we groaned down in the elevator. Where? Anywhere. Keep your hands off the lever, snapped the elevator boy. I beg your pardon, said Mr. McKee with dignity. I didn't know I was touching it. After that, Nick uses an ellipsis and floats in and out of consciousness. Uh, he's beside Mr. McKee's bed, and Mr. McKee is in his underwear, and then suddenly, after another ellipsis, Nick wakes up in the Pennsylvania station. So an ellipsis, firstly, is used to indicate a uh, broach in time, right? Or an omission, if you will, an intentional omission. So Nick is intentionally leaving some stuff out there for us. And for a first-person narrator to leave stuff out, um, there has to be a reason to it. It doesn't just happen. Um, then, okay, let's go back to the elevator scene, right? Mr. McKee and Nick are going down in the elevator, and suddenly the elevator boy yells at them, keep your hands off the lever, and Mr. McKee's like, sorry, I, I, I didn't know I was touching it. Now, he says this with dignity, which tells me in the narration that Mr. McKee means it, right? He didn't know he was touching the lever. So what could he have been grabbing hold of that's lever-shaped, um, you know, what did he think he was grabbing instead? I'm not going to spell it out for you guys, but um, I think Mr. McKee and Nick were getting a little frisky, and Mr. McKee, <laughs> in his drunkenness, was grabbing the elevator's lever when he really meant to be grabbing something else. Anyway, again, what that episode, it's very subtle, um, and you don't have to believe it's true necessarily because it's certainly just, um, I'm arguing it to be true because I think the evidence is there and it adds to my understanding of Nick as a narrator. But what I believe is that Nick is bisexual because he has this encounter with Mr. McKee and that allows us to understand moving forward when Nick, uh, starts to describe this Gatsby character we're about to meet in chapter three, he can assess him as both someone who respects him as a man and is attracted to him. So we get multiple perspectives. Or, as Nick would say, he is both within and without. Another thing I want to talk about is why does Tom break Myrtle's nose? Uh, she's saying Daisy's name over and over and over again, and, and Tom at that point breaks her nose, right? I think that Tom never believed that Myrtle was ever going to be to his standard. Um, I mean, Nick even tells us in the beginning of the chapter, Myrtle's not attractive. Why is Tom interested in a relationship with her? Maybe just for the danger, maybe just for the excitement of having an affair. But he doesn't ever believe that Myrtle is going to be upper class. And certainly the thing about old money is uh, you can't become old money like overnight. It's got to be generations and generations of of wealth. No matter how hard Myrtle tries, no matter how hard anyone pursuing their dream tries, in his lifetime, he's never going to see them become like him, like Daisy, like Jordan, like Nick. Their generations of wealth separates them from so many other Americans. Truly, to him, an elite 
club, an elite private status that is almost impossible to achieve, right? To be rich for that long and to, to be born into it, not something you can just accomplish in your lifetime, right? You're gonna get into chapter three next. Uh, hope maybe some of you some of you guys have already finished it. Uh, so good job on that. But chapter three, we are finally going to attend one of Gatsby's parties. We've heard people talking about them through the first two chapters. So we're gonna attend a Gatsby party and we're gonna meet Gatsby for the first time. The thing to think about as we meet Gatsby is um, what is it for? What is the party really trying, or what is Gatsby really trying to accomplish with these parties of his? Think about that. Um, read chapter three, enjoy it. Uh, it's filled with some really great narration on Nick's part as he tries to manage his way through this account of, of this party while drunk. Um, or, you know, he tries to retell a moment in his life when he was drunk. It's, it's pretty entertaining. Um, but again, it calls into question some of his narrative uh, ability. Anyway, that's chapter two for you guys. Enjoy chapter three. I'll see you on Wednesday.